All right, so moving on, we're going to dive into a little bit here. Uh, Scott Riker uh, is going to give a talk about um, looking at the current and near future oyster hatchery capacity in the southeastern U.S. So I get to work with Scott. Appreciate you doing it. Thank you, Bill. Just a quick show of hands. How many oyster farmers in the southeast do we have? Hold your hands up. Okay. <coughs> Keep your hands up. <laughs> How many folks got enough seed last year? Too much. Okay, my talk's done. <laughs> okay. All right, we did a we did a survey in 2014 looking at hatchery capacity and and the potential capacity in the southeast. Um, I've talked to some of the friends, some of our friends in the room here, and and kind of updated that talk. Uh, kind of. Uh, we gave this talk at NSA in 2014, but we've updated it with some of the new numbers from this past season. Um, so to address seed capacity, first we need to look and see what uh, state regulations for oyster seed and importing oyster seed are. And then we're going to look at current hatchery production and then what hatcheries tell me they think their potential is. So first, uh, in the southeast, most states have provisions for off-bottom moisture farming, but not all. Um, Georgia. Georgia currently does not have any provisions for off-bottom moisture farming, but they're working towards that. They do have nine demonstration farms right now. Uh, in Mississippi, Mississippi's kind of new to the game. Uh, they have, have just developed provisions for off-bottom moisture farming. They're in the process of permitting some areas. Uh, but currently there are, there are no active farms in the area. They do have some hatcheries in Mississippi coming on the line also. Um, and Texas, John, John Scarpa. John's gonna give us an update later on Texas. Currently there are no provisions for off-bottom oyster culture in, in Texas. Uh, but there is interest and I think they're working towards uh, allowing that. Um, so, you know, depending on where you are, you may have hatcheries in your state, you may not. Um, but there's a lot of regulation about where you can bring seed from and, and where you can, where you can, uh, what coast you can bring it from and whether you can and you can't. So in uh, all the states in the Gulf of Mexico uh, will not allow seed from the Atlantic coast. There's some disease concerns, uh, so we can't bring seed in from the Atlantic coast. <laughs> but the reverse is not necessarily true depending on what state you're in. Some states allow seed from the Gulf of Mexico to go to the Atlantic coast. Uh, Florida and Georgia do not. Florida is a special case because they've got both coasts, uh, but they do not allow uh, seed from the Gulf Coast to go to the Atlantic coast and vice versa. Um, North Carolina and South Carolina both allow seed from the Gulf of Mexico to come into the state. Um, uh, our, our first talk today mentioned may not be the best thing. You know, Gulf Coast seed might not be the best thing to use up in South Carolina, North Carolina, but when you don't have any other options, sometimes you gotta go that route. Uh, real quickly about seed import regulations from different states. Uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, if you wanna bring seed in from outside the state, you've gotta have a permit. It's gotta be disease certified. It's got to be certified or inspected that it doesn't have invasive species or non-invasive species riding along with the seed. Um, those states allow pre-approval of hatcheries, um, but you have to you have to renew that approval every year. As a hatchery manager on the Gulf Coast, I can tell you, filling out the paperwork for these is a, is a pain in the butt to do every year. But if you want to provide seed to these folks, you've got to do that paperwork. Uh, Georgia currently. Uh, does not allow importation of seed. Um, again, they're working to develop off-bottom moisture farming. Uh, they have made exceptions for experimental purposes and those require uh, disease testing for MSX and Dermo. Florida. Um, I've dealt a lot with Florida. Uh, shipping seed from Alabama to Florida. Uh, they do require disease certification. Um, but that certification has to be certified by a veterinarian. How many folks know a veterinarian that knows anything about oysters? <laughs> One grower whose father is a veterinarian. 
And he is the one veterinarian that is certified in seed to go to Florida. <laughs> what I didn't realize when I was first, first looking for veterinarians to do the certification, that veterinarian has to be in the state of origin. Uh, you can't, if you're sending seed from Alabama to Florida, that veterinarian can't be in Florida. Or it can't be uh, Roxanne Smallwitz up in Rhode Island. Uh, it has to be from the state of origin. Makes it a little difficult. In Florida, there's some genetic restrictions for diploids. Uh, if, if any out-of-state hatcheries want to produce diploids for Florida, there are genetic restrictions that the, uh, you have to use genetic stock from Florida. They have made an exception for triploids uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, long as that, that genetic stock comes from the Gulf of Mexico and it's triploid, it, it doesn't necessarily have to uh, originate in Florida. Uh, again, you have the coast of origin restrictions. In Alabama, um, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources uh, approves hatcheries. Currently, we have two approved. Uh, John Supan's <coughs> over in Grand Isle and, and our hatchery at, at Auburn. Um, there are more hatcheries uh, coming online, and we hope we can get some more approval from, for those. But I can tell you that our Department of Conservation and Natural Resources is probably going to look at the genetics a little more, and they're probably going to restrict genetics from Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana to our area. So if Florida hatcheries want to grow for, for Alabama, Louisiana, you're probably going to have to get brood stock from those areas. Uh, Mississippi. Mississippi is just getting into the game. Uh, they're, they're working on their regulations. They will allow imports of seed, uh, but they're in the process of developing those, the, the process for importing seed. Uh, Jason, Jason's going to give us a talk later about uh, updates on Mississippi's status. Uh, Louisiana, you got to have written permission from Louisiana Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, there are probably going to be genetic restrictions. I don't think Louisiana allows stuff from Florida, do you? No? no. They're mostly concerned about green mussels coming in. Yeah, okay. Um, Texas, <coughs> Texas, Texas, <laughs> Texas. Um, they have made exceptions for importing seed for inland ponds. Um, I don't think that worked out too well. Um, they are working on possible legislation for off-bottom oyster farming. Uh, if that happens, there will be permits required from Texas Parks and Wildlife. Uh, John will probably explain the, the genetic restrictions. It's, uh, it's, they've got, they feel like they've got two distinct genetic populations, well, we north do. and south. We do. We do. It's, 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 they do. <laughs> and, and they're going to want fruit stock from those areas to go into those areas. Okay, uh, so we did this capacity survey in 2014. I've updated some of the numbers for 2017. Uh, we're going to look at current production and then we're going to look at maximum potential. Um, these are all the, the hatcheries we surveyed. The ones in red didn't produce oysters. Uh, the ones in yellow had produced oysters but may not currently produce. And the ones in green were the currently producing uh, hatcheries. Now again, some of this data is, is three years old. Some of those yellow hatcheries may be producing now. Some of these green ones might not. So if we look at larval production in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, or across both coasts, a lot of, a lot of larval production in the Gulf, uh, not so much on the Atlantic. Uh, now again, this is from North Carolina South. Uh, Folks in North Carolina get a lot of seed out of Virginia. Um, but there's a caveat with the Gulf of Mexico. Um, a lot of the larvae is coming from John, a lot of the larvae is coming from Auburn, but there's a good bit of that larvae that's going for seeding reefs or remote setting. Uh, we've got some Mississippi hatcheries coming online, and right now all that larvae is going for uh, remote setting. It's not necessarily for single seed production for commercial growers. So if we drop all that out, we get something that looks a little closer between the coasts. <coughs> Still, the Gulf of Mexico is producing about 
a little over 50 million larvae for single seed production. Uh, Atlantic coast is about 18 million. Um, now, I don't have good updated numbers for North Carolina or the Florida coast, but they were pretty small in our original survey. Um, so if we break it down by state, um, in 2014, Georgia and South Carolina, there were no barns there. Uh, so since 2014, um, Julie has worked with Frank Roberts uh, to get some production going in South Carolina. Um, Tom Bliss is, is working in Georgia to start producing there. Um, so that's, and that's been a big benefit to some of the other hatcheries that, that have tried to cover those states. Um, and I'm glad to see, see Georgia ramping up to, the, to start coming into uh, production. Um, these numbers here, uh, Louisiana probably produces a lot more larvae than anybody else, uh, John's Hatchery, uh, but a lot of that is going to seed reefs. Uh, whereas at Auburn, the majority of our production is dedicated to single seed production. Um, I also mentioned Mississippi is producing larvae. There is an inland hatchery that's producing larvae, but none of that is going to single seed production at this time. Uh, if we look at, uh, okay, so that was larvae. This is looking at single seed production. Um, and again, this does not reflect anything coming from north of North Carolina. So this number looks small, but there's a lot of seed coming from Virginia down to North Carolina. Um, but the majority of what's represented here is, is what's being produced for South Carolina, for the growers in South Carolina, and the demonstration farms in Georgia. I don't have good numbers for the Florida Atlantic coast right now. Um, all this seed production, I can, I can tell you, between John and I, we could have probably produced three times that many and not met all the orders. Uh, we left a lot of orders on the table this year, and there's some issues with, with larval mortality that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, so again, if we break it down by state, again, caveats here. I don't have good numbers for, these are old numbers for North Carolina and the, the Florida Atlantic coast. Um, and, you know, this, this, is, uh, this is relatively new in South Carolina, uh, and I'm so happy to see it. I've had many orders for, for larvae out of South Carolina. And it's, it's very tough to produce for your own state, but then trying to produce for other states and Atlantic coast states. It gets, gets very stressful. Um, so I'm glad to see some production up there, and I'm thrilled to see uh, Tom's Hatchery coming online in Georgia. Um, and then in the, in, the, uh, in the Gulf, the majority of seeds being produced by Auburn and uh, LSU. So now if we look, if we switch from looking at uh, current production, but let's look at the potential, what hatcheries tell us in a perfect world what they can produce. We switch from looking at millions to billions. Um, but again, this is what people think in their head in a perfect world. Some of us dream bigger than others. Um, so you see in, in the Gulf, we should have a lot of laurel supply if things work properly. We're over three billion. Atlantic Coast, you're you're over uh, a half a billion. Again, with the seed demands right now, that should be enough. Uh, if you break it down by state, again, you see a lot of production in the Gulf of Mexico. A lot of this production in Florida, or this potential production, this was an estimate by a hatchery that currently is not producing oysters. But this is what they say they could produce if they were if they were up and running. Uh, and actually, this one hatchery said they could do 8.3 billion. Uh, yes. Uh, but he currently is not producing. He may produce a handful of good ones. Um, uh, John Gill. John, I do have good numbers from John. Uh, so this little fraction up here is John's. 
all this is is dreamy. Um, so we've got you know we've got a lot of hatchery capacity here, but it's it's, it's not being met. Um, again, breaking breaking down that you take that that imagined potential for larvae, and you start looking at what kind of seed you can produce from that. Again, we should have adequate seed for the area, but we don't. Um, uh, again, there's, there's a caveat with this in Florida. This is, this is not happening, but this is what, if somebody switched over from doing all clams to all oysters, this is what they think they could produce. Um, I feel like these numbers for Alabama and Louisiana are pretty realistic. What, what we think we could do right now if things were working well. Uh, I put a question mark by Mississippi. Mississippi has one hatchery running right now that's producing larvae. It's all going to remote set. Um, they have a second hatchery hopefully coming online this year. But currently there are no, no plans for single seed production um, for this year. Uh, as they develop uh, off bottom oyster culture, we hope that will start coming online. Um, so why are we not reaching that potential? Uh, resource dedication. Atlantic coast hatcheries, a lot of those are producing clams. Uh, Florida Gulf Coast, uh, a lot of that's producing clams. Um, we're using a lot of oyster larvae for, for uh, seeding reefs, doing a remote set in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. A lot of that larvae is not, not used for producing single seed. Um, and then both uh, the hatcheries producing single seed, John's and mine, we also produce stuff for research too. So we've got a lot of demands from different agencies, different universities. Um, so resource dedication. Uh, but again, the potential is there. We should be meeting those orders. Um, but what we see in the Gulf of Mexico in the last year and a half is a lot of larval mortality. And that's something we're working hard to figure out what's going on, what's happening, why are we losing so many larvae. Um, we're getting poor larval survival through, from hatcheries throughout the Gulf. Um, some hatcheries are losing them, uh, are having poor growth in the early stages, poor survival in our hatchery at Auburn. We get them up to right before they're going to set, and then they all fall out and lay on bottom. Uh, we're losing them around day 10 to day 14. Uh, it's very disappointing when you've got two weeks invested in, in you know, 40, 50 million larvae, and you come in and you just see black on the bottom of the tanks. Uh, but it, again, it's something we're working on to figure out. I'm going to use Auburn as an example. This was our larval production. Um, oyster farming really started taking off in about 2012. We peaked uh, production at over 180 million in 2014, and you can see how we dropped off in 2015 and 16. It really hit us in, the, in July of 2015. Uh, same with seed production. Um, <coughs> we met all our orders in 2014, just over 12 million. That has dropped way off. Uh, again, we could have sold triple this number of seed this year. <coughs> we just could not produce enough larvae to meet those seed needs. Um, possible causes, ocean acidification, we feel like we've ruled that out. We've done a lot of, a lot of different uh, additions to our water to try to, to see if that was a problem. It doesn't seem to be. We looked at our food source. That doesn't seem to be an issue. Possible toxic contamination, probably not likely because it's so widespread. It would have to be something affecting. Uh, bacterial and viral issues. We're doing some work with FDA right now where we sequence all the DNA and samples of larvae and samples of water. We throw it in the database and it spits out absolutely every bacteria or virus protozoan that's in that water. Uh, we're still sorting through this data, but these are some early results. Uh, it's not these nice colorful bars here are some healthy larvae very diverse populations of viruses. Uh, this is some very poor larvae here, uh, dominated by two species of Vibrio Uh If you've got bacteria, uh, then you've got bacteriophages to fight the bacteria. Uh, so this is probably an indication that we, maybe we've got a Vibrio issue. Uh, 
Uh, there's a lot of data to sort through, uh, and this is something something fairly new to me. Uh, I want to thank Andy for putting us in touch with with a colleague up in Maryland to, to do some of this data. It's really interesting stuff, and I, I hope it's going to lead to figuring out what our problem is. Um, so, in conclusion, we've we've got adequate capacity if we can do if we can overcome some of the problems. Um, and if we start shifting some resources around. Uh, but there's a lot of reliance on Auburn. There's a lot of reliance on John over in Louisiana. Uh, there's room for, for private hatcheries to take some of that load uh, so that we can get back to focusing on research and addressing some of the problems with, with uh, uh, you know, some of the questions with oyster aquaculture and not having to spend so much time focused on seed production. But in, until that happens, we're still in the game. We're still going to be producing. Uh, but we hope the commercial industry will, will come in and take some of that load. Um, as the Atlantic coast grows, there's very little seed, seed production there. That's going to have to come up. We're relying on Julie to take care of that. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, thanks, Scott.